is the what is your overview of the book for people who haven't read it? Because many people in this conversation probably are thinking of buying it, you know, after they listen to us. And then the other question is, what does the word neurodiversity mean to you? And before I get out of the way, I just want to say people do not realize always that the concept of neurodiversity is still really a new thing. And it's writers like you and I who are contributing to its making of meaning. Um, and in fact, my book in uh, England does not have the word neurodiversity in the subtitle because nobody had heard of it. <laughs> and, uh, I couldn't convince them to use it. Um, anyway, what does the word neurodiversity mean to you? And what is the takeaway uh, or some of the big takeaways from your book for people who haven't read it yet? Yeah, thank you so much, Steve and Pamela. It was such a sweet introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. This is really wonderful. So yeah, so this is the book, um, Divergent Mind. Um, so to answer the question, I mean, neurodiversity is, is often used in different ways for different people, depending on the community or even the academic field. Um, for me, it, it means really the essence of that word, right? It's neurological diversity. And that's sort of the basic vocabulary definition of that word. Um, in terms of how we use that word, how we apply it and the meaning that it has come to have in society, it's really about acknowledging the diverse array of brain makeups that we have in the human species um, in comparison to something like biodiversity. And um, there's you know, a movement that has grown around it. And really, I think people should know that it, it encompasses everything from bipolar and schizophrenia to of course, autism and ADHD, dyslexia, OCD, um, so I think for me, you know, I grew up in the heart of San Francisco around a very wide range of different types of characters. So for me, I think neurodiversity has always made sense in terms of understanding um, this about humanity, right? That we're all kind of wired differently. Um, and that is kind of the spirit with which I write about neurodiversity in my book and also um, the way I just employ the term in, in my own family or with friends and colleagues. Um, so then, yeah, in the, the book specifically, I decided to focus on adult women because adult women are, um, you know, have been pathologized throughout history um, and are still neglected in uh, medical research, psychological research. Um, women were like the rules around including women in studies didn't really start to get enforced until the 1990s. So it's so recent. And um, so in the book, I dive into first the history, looking at how women have been pathologized throughout time. I focus on the trait of sensitivity so I look at how autism, ADHD, highly sensitive person, synesthesia, and then sensory processing disorder, how these all have high sensitivity in common, but that throughout history, the trait of sensitivity itself has been pathologized. And um, probably many people who are watching or listening have heard the term hysteria. Um, and so the book is really a reframing of what it means to be sensitive and really um, you know, diving into interviews with women and then looking at the future and how we can um, benefit from sensitivity and how the world really needs more of this trait. In fact, it can be a, uh, an enormous antidote to a lot of modern social ills. That's great. Um, one of the points that you make uh, in the book that I think is really valuable is that if you notice conditions like autism and ADHD and dyslexia, they're all names of, you know, dysfunctions, really, because they come from this psychiatric establishment that was uh, very keen on defining normal and then defining really a whole lot of people as not normal. So they would have, you know, something to do. <laughs> uh, but in any case, um, you make the point that if a significant chunk of the population is abnormal, what good is normal? What does, you know, what does normal mean? And in fact, there's another excellent book that just came out called Nobody's Normal by Roy Grinker, which is very much sort of a, 
I would say a sister book to yours in a way and 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 to mine too. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier that growing up in San Francisco sort of introduced you to the diversity of human experience. How was that and what did it show you? And that's where I am now. I'm in the Haight-Ashbury. I know, yeah. Yep. I have so much pride about growing up in San Francisco and um, probably some people who are uh, watching are familiar. You know, I share about this a lot on social media. Um, so yeah, I grew up in the Haight-Ashbury. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was a public school kid. So I took public transportation every day for 45 minutes to and from school. Wow. And so every single day, my sister and I, we were exposed to all of San Francisco's characters with nobody there to tell us what was wrong or what was bad or dangerous or anything like that. And so we really navigated that by ourselves. And um, so, yeah, I think um, that's, again, that's kind of the spirit that has informed a lot of my work. Uh, I grew up in a very racially diverse neighborhood. I was always the minority at my school um, on the, on the, you know, on Muni every day going to school. Um, I would get actually into really deep philosophical conversations with with fellow passengers who were clearly um, um, unhoused, um, you know, homeless. And so um, that for me was always intriguing. And I think I always felt a, a kinship and a synergy in some way that I was, I, I felt somehow connected to people who seemed to be on the fringes. And, and I didn't have the words for that. I knew that I, um, I don't know, I was different, right, from, from kids around me, and I get into that in the book. Um, but so, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to drive it home. It's just, you know, imagine yourself in the heart of San Francisco or on a bus, and you, you look around you, and everyone is so different from you, and so that becomes your norm. Like, that yeah. is my norm. That is my norm. I don't, like, when I think of how I grew up or what is normal to me, that is what I imagine. I imagine so many people who look different and um, I don't at all imagine like other white people or anything like that because that was not my lived experience. And so, um, yeah, so for me, there is some parallels there around just immersion in, in diversity as a whole. That's great. So um, you define yourself as neurodivergent, is that correct? Yes, yeah. And how did that happen? How did you discover your own neurodivergence? Yeah, so um, I, I was always a very sensitive kid and I always got that feedback from, from everyone around me, like in my family, you know, at school, everything. But again, growing up in San Francisco where, you know, people are pretty accepting. I never got labeled as anything. And um, so a huge impetus for the book actually was sort of tracing that a little bit that as I got older, the sensitivity was harder to manage uh, because as you become an adult, you know, you take on more, you, you've got love and friendship and work and college and all sorts of things. And so um, in my case, it just grew and grew and built. I mean, I had, I had seen different therapists. I had um, been told that I had anxiety and things like this. And a lot of this never felt like a fit. It just wasn't like a full picture for me. And this is pretty classic. It turns out a lot of women had this experience. Then um, I had been a reporter in Asia. And I, after I moved back to the US, I had a really hard time adjusting. It was like new routines, new responsibilities. Um, just everything was different. And I was trying to make sense of why it was so difficult. You know, I had been to the Harvard School of Public Health. I went to UC Berkeley. I had a lot of, um, you know, publishing credentials under my belt, but you know, when it came time to switch into something like dishes, laundry, keeping track of a schedule, um, I basically almost fell apart. And so I was talking about this a lot actually. And then believe it or not, one by one, these articles started popping up in my Facebook feed um, because you know, that's how it goes, right? So I started seeing this research about women who were kind of the lost generation and who were being missed in the mental health research um, around autism and ADHD. 
So I got really curious because again, here I'm a reporter. I have this background in like public health and science. So the book came about, came about from that nexus of the personal and professional. Um, I think reading your book, Steve, was huge for me. I, I of course saw myself in your book. Um, it was a real light bulb moment for me. Um, at the same time, I did not at all feel compelled to seek out diagnosis because of everything I was reading, because I had already spent so many years in therapy, I had been told different things. And I was just kind of like, what the hell, you know, especially that women were being so missed. And so being a reporter, someone who gets to dive into research and interview people, that was the route that I went. I really just took this on as my own investigative journey. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it came about. Yeah. A, uh, an artistic friend of mine, uh, in fact, it was at the first reading that ever happened for my book, In the Hate Ashbury. She said that getting a diagnosis of autism uh, in midlife was, quote, like finding a Rosetta Stone to myself, which I thought was a really powerful uh, statement. You mentioned the phrase lost generation, and I actually wanted to read a paragraph from your book uh, because it brought something to mind. You write, an entire demographic of women is now being referred to as a lost generation because an extensive amount of depression and anxiety surface as a result of internal experiences that don't match up with what the world expects or how the world views such women since they appear to function normally on the outside. So as, as you know, the labels high functioning and low functioning, which I never use myself, um, uh, are thrown around a lot, particularly by clinicians and researchers uh, in the autism field. Um, how useful are those labels? If these women are suffering tremendously, you know, and yet they're praised for being high functioning, what's the problem there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I get more into that in the later on in the book. Um, I think, like, I'm a, a, just a huge fan and proponent of people just speaking like, you know, their, their true selves and kind of just being open and narrating what's happening on the inside. I, my firm belief is that if we did have that in our wider culture, where people were honest about what they were going through, I think we actually would see a ton more similarities. Okay. But that is not our culture. People still feel like they have to hold back and hide who they are or, um, are you there? It looks like it's glitching a little bit. I'll just keep I'm here. Talking. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, since we have this sort of like really proper buttoned up um, masking culture as a whole, we don't actually know how much we all have in common right across the spectrum. Um, so I yeah, so that's why we don't use these labels in terms of high functioning and low functioning. Um, we're seeing a little bit of that on Twitter, which is really great. You know, people who are really fighting that kind of labeling because it doesn't fit. Um, and so I, you know, I also don't think that people have to narrate beyond what they're comfortable with. Right. But in a safe space for people to really connect and share, I think we'll see that people have a lot more in common than we realize or what people look like on the outside. Um, so, yeah. I think that's a beautiful uh, statement and thought uh, and belief. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, could you talk a little bit more about masking? Because people who are outside of the autism community might not have heard that term. Sure. What is it? And what kind of toll does it take, particularly on neurodivergent women? Right. So yeah, masking is this term that we use to uh, describe what we do, like a mask that we put on to function and interact in like the neurotypical world. Um, and it's really painful and it's, it's quite frankly dangerous. Um, so I always describe this process that uh, many people go through and who I portray in the book that it's like an onion, you know, on the outside are these layers of depression and anxiety. And that's, that's what a therapist will see. That's what a doctor, a psychiatrist will see. But what's required is a lot deeper probing, right? We need to unpeel that onion and see, you know, what's at the core, which is often, you know, sensory challenges, uh, 
neurological differences. And, you know, um, that, that vocabulary needs to be kind of like unearthed a little bit. I mean, clinicians, therapists need to be trained on the new research so they know kind of what to ask about. But yeah, I mean, just years and years go by with people being misdiagnosed and really suffering and huge amounts of shame build up uh, when, when that kind of masking is required. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what changes would you like to see in the public perception of autism and women? Yeah, I think there's a lot happening right now, which is really cool. Um, you know, I think like Hannah Gadsby, her, you know, she's a Netflix comedian. Oh. Yeah, Douglas is amazing. I mean, yeah, yeah. Douglas yeah. And, and and her first one, Nanette. Uh, yeah. So that is definitely like changing the conversation. I am also hearing from a lot more women who are kind of um, their public personas and they are kind of getting ready to come out as autistic. Um, and I think that's really interesting because we, we still have so many stereotypes that are based on, you know, studies that were based on, on men and boys. And there's a lot of socialization that happens with gender. So um, I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to when the reality of what autism is, is, is more understood in the public and where it's not so boxed in uh, because there is, the reality is there is a huge range, right? I mean, it, we're talking about neurodiversity, neurological diversity, right? Like no two autistic people are exactly the same. Um, there can be a lot of commonalities, but the expression, the way it looks and presents is gonna be, uh, is gonna be different. So, you know, in, in, in Divergent Mind, I focus a lot on the trait of sensitivity. So, I think there's there there is a very uh, deep, imaginative, reflective, highly empathetic quality to being on the spectrum, and that's what I focused on in the book. And I'm starting to hear more people in the public kind of echo that. And um, yeah, I think we need even more of that. Uh, the writer Catherine May, who just wrote a bestseller, Wintering, you know, she was just interviewed on Krista Tippett's On Being, you know, which is all mm. about like spirit and inner life. And I was just so happy to see that. I knew that would happen at, at some point. And, and I think that's a wonderful match. So Catherine is um, autistic and she writes very beautifully about, you know, nature and inner life and contemplation. And so I think we're I think we're going to start seeing more of that. Yeah, that's great. And one of my uh, favorite books that came out last year was Diary of a Young Naturalist by Dara McAnulty. Yeah. Um, he wrote the book. You know, I got I got the the manuscript like over the transom, as they used to say, like in my email. And I thought, oh, my God, a 14 year old is writing a book. And I started reading. It was like reading like young Oliver Sacks. You know, I like I, I told I told him right away. I said, dude, you're a genius. This book is going to be a bestseller. Like it was one of the best books I've ever read. And it wasn't just like my life with autism. It was really his observations as a young naturalist. And I think one of the best, most promising developments um, in the, yeah, uh, Chris Martin, my friend in this uh, room here, just to be published in America by Milkweed Editions, uh, Dara's book, um, oh. is, is people with, with, you know, various forms of neurodivergence, writing about not just my life story as a dyslexic or something, but seeing the world with those eyes and telling us what they see, basically. I think that's a really promising thing. Yeah. If you could have a wish list of uh, cha significant changes in society that would make the world a, a better place for neurodivergent people, a more comfortable place, where they could not just survive, but thrive, what would you suggest? Well, that's such a great question. Um, I think, I mean, I would start with, the, again, this, uh, like, just the openness. Um, I, I am a firm believer that we just need to break down all sorts of social norms around, like, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, so, you know, we're seeing that more and more with social media, people sharing about their mental health and things like that. But, 
you know, the more that that happens, then that stigma goes away, right? The pathologization goes away. If there's um, an accepting environment where people can narrate what's happening, you know, within themselves, uh, that is a good starting place that, you know, will go a long way. I really believe that. Um, and then, uh, I guess related to that, I, I feel like the, the world of work and career is just so important. And I focus on it a lot in the book because I mean, career and work is tied into our sense of agency, like having an income, being able to, you know, just do things, right? Just get stuff done and feel like kind of actualized in the world. And that we have a long way to go with that. I, I really do. I mean, we have all these kind of like neurodiversity hiring programs and stuff, but I just feel like that's so limited that tends to really focus on like white male tech workers in Silicon Valley. It's such a bigger picture, right? I mean, you know, if there could be someone who is talking to themselves, you know, while they're teaching a class or at work or, you know, someone who is um, stimming or, you know, that is where I want to see things go. I want it to be a much bigger conversation than again, these just like white dudes in Silicon Valley. Um, and that's a great step, but it's it's a much, much bigger thing. So um, yeah, I, I again, I think that's related though to the social norms. So as much as we can do to change the conversation in the media as journalists and writers, that's huge. Um, that's a big focus of my work. I mean, I. The Neurodiversity Project is this group I started really organically in, in the Bay Area several years ago and involved, to, you know, we host authors. Now we're doing it on Instagram since we can't do live. Um, so um, yeah, anyways, I'm just, I think that people have different roles to play in, in changing social norms. And it's important that people do that wherever they are. If you're a member of the media, um, if you are a hiring manager at work, if you're a film producer, I mean, anyone. I thought I thought one one of the one of my favorite parts of your book was um, your description of what's really going on in a typical job interview. You have Greg, who's your potential boss, saying, "What was it like living in Nepal?" And then you you say, "Janar is insides. Is he asking whether I'm unreliable because I've traveled so much? Is he trying to assess whether I'm going to pick up and go travel again?" I see his balding head and heavy eyes and wedding ring. Is everything okay at home with his family? I feel really sad. What happened to him? What were his parents like? And then you say, Janara is outside. It was awesome. <laughs> that was that was brilliant. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the things that you one of the positive steps that you talk about is uh, a person called Margo, I think, at Yahoo, who built an employee resource group. I've spoken to uh, a group like that at Square. What can a neurodivergent employee research, sorry, resource group offer employees in a, in a big tech company? That's a good question. Um, this is a hard one. Again, I don't really focus on like, you know, HR and workplace stuff. Yeah. I, I really do think it goes back to the social norms um, yeah. because if, if an employee at a company like Square or whatever, let's say they're feeling super slow, you know, let's mm -hmm. say they're having what, you know, what many people call autistic burnout or something. Mm -hmm. um, what is the company going to do? Like, I don't mm -hmm. think that most companies think of neurodiversity acceptance in this mm -hmm. way, because this right. is the reality. This is the reality, you know, getting migraines for several days in a row. Like, it's just not enough. Um, I, to be perfectly honest, have faced this in my own life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been many times when I've thought about, you know, moving from being kind of like a freelancer who, you know, works at home and can set my own schedule to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe trying something a little bit more traditional, but it, the reality is just, it would never work. I mean, I experience sensory overwhelm a lot. I, I, I do have migraines a lot. Um, so I don't know. I actually spoke to Bitch Media about this, um, and I call it like a collective softening. I think that mm -hmm. until our culture as a whole softens and this sort of late stage 
capitalism, like obsession with productivity until that starts to come down. I don't think it will ever be like a friendly place, quite frankly, for, uh, for most neurodivergent people. Um, so I'm all about, you know, just kind of changing it all. I, I don't, I don't really believe in these like piecemeal things. Do this in the book uh, because uh, looks like it cut out. Moment. <laughs> Hopefully, he will be coming back in. Okay, looks like he's there. Be back. Hey, I'm back. Can you guys yeah. hear me? I, yeah, I hear you, but I can't see you. Okay, can't see me. Can't see you. Let me try this. There you are. Sorry, just Yay. just lost the connection. Yep. Is everything is everything cool again? Yeah. We're yeah. Good. Um, uh, <laughs> except I forgot what I was going to ask you. Uh, well, maybe we can go to uh, audience uh, Q and A. Um, I'd love to hear some of the questions that people have uh, posed. Is Pamela going to help us with that? Or yes, I am. I'm right okay. here. Um, okay, I need. We are having all kinds of tech trouble tonight. Janara, I need you to start my video for me. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh... If you hover over participants, mm -hmm. and then you'll see Steve, you and me, and you will need to reintroduce me as- A co-host? Co-host, right. Okay. Somehow got bumped on that. So, okay, Pamela, you are a co host now. Co host, all right. Let me get my camera on. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. <laughs> yeah. I saw several people also had said that they didn't see the link. I have re entered it several times in the chat box. So, you should be able to copy and paste that. Um, and you can save it for after the event. And on to the questions. We've had some very good questions. Um, Chris Martin is asking if you think that neurotypical people actually exist. And if so, do you think that neurotypical people have a responsibility to divest themselves from a neuronormative framework in which they are used to discipline anyone who strays from the so-called norm? That's a great question. Chris is a friend of Steve and I, so. <laughs> um, Chris is awesome. Chris does amazing awesome. work with non-speaking poets. Book next year, his book's coming out next year. Um, so the question is around like neurotypicals and um, I think this is a really interesting question. I, I do talk about that in the book. Uh, it is confusing, quite frankly, because I feel like the more people I talk to who, um, now that I've written this book, I feel like everyone opens up to me because you know they know that's kind of what I'm about. Uh, again, since we haven't had this wider culture of like sharing our inner lives, a lot of people just don't know what's up with everyone. But when people do start sharing, you, you start to realize uh, perhaps, perhaps there isn't, you know, um, one normal, that, that's a possibility. Uh, but because we don't talk about that, we've continued to categorize and sort of, we have this binary of normal and abnormal. Um, that said, society certainly rewards a certain way of functioning and operating in the world. And those people, um, some of this is cultural. I mean, a lot of this is just white supremacy and inheriting um, white neuronormativity. People who can embody that the best are the ones who stay on top. Um, and so I 100% do think that there is a responsibility and accountability for people who, um, who occupy that position, you know, uh, people who, uh, you know, we, we can call it neurotypical supremacy. Um, and I think that's a hard one, right? Because people don't want to give up power. People don't want to, don't want things to change if it's working for them. Um, so we'll see. I, I think we'll start to see more of those doors being knocked down as this conversation gets larger and people kind of come together. 
Um, our next question is from someone who says that they have misophonia and their husband gets very frustrated with them. Any suggestions? And could you please define misophonia for the audience? Yeah, misophonia, um, I talk about it in the book, um, is a um, pretty intense sensitivity to sound and certain kinds of sounds. And uh, for some reason, it's often a sensitivity to the sound of chewing. And it often presents when kids are young, um, but it can, it can remain through adulthood. And um, so was the question about how to cope or what was the? Um, yes, that um, it, her husband gets frustrated with her. And frustrated, yeah. That's a hard one. I mean, uh, in the book, I do go into some of that nitty gritty. I mean, a lot of this is just about communication and changing these conversations, right? I mean, even in my own family, I mean, we've had to do so much work. Um, I, I'm like the neurodivergent one. So it's required me to really carve out that space and communicate my needs. And um, so basically what I would say to answer this question is kind of like, everyone needs to get on board. Uh, there needs to be a deeper understanding that everyone is different. Everyone has different forms of sensitivities. Also, people respond to things differently. If the person in question you know, is the type who really needs to see like a research study. Um, you can even show them my book. Um, there's actually um, a whole website and newsletter called Allergic to Sound. Um, that's like all about misophonia. I talk about it in the book. So uh, it just kind of depends on the angle, you know? Um, in my house, like science and research is, is a big thing. So I rely on stuff like that to kind of convey my points. Um, so yeah. Right. There's a question a little bit later in the Q&A section here that someone wrote in and said, if they wanted a diagnosis as an adult woman, what type of practitioner should they visit to get that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you are seeking out diagnosis, again, like people can go either way. Like some people are um, really happy with just like having this information and feeling seen and understood and that kind of thing. If someone wants to seek out formal diagnosis and get accommodations at school or work, that's also great. Um, so usually you can find people who are, you know, licensed psychologists who might have a specialty in diagnosing autism or ADHD. Of course, often the specialty is with kids is that's sort of where most of the research has been it can be a little trickier to find someone who might uh, specialize in adults but more and more we're finding that there's usually like one or two people like in a given area or region that is gaining expertise in this and it's kind of their niche that they've carved out um also in my book, actually, I interview some really wonderful uh, therapists and people who are really familiar with this in adults. So definitely, um, you know, feel free to contact. And I've heard from some of them like, oh, thank you. You know, um, I so-and-so found me through your book and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, there is a list of recommended resources in the back of the book, as well as notes about books that you consulted in the writing as well. Mm -hmm. And our next question is um, about areas of research. You mentioned that the research gap with, there was a research gap with autistic women. And this person is wondering if you both thought that there were the most, what were the most important neurodiversity research areas that should be focused on? I, I have one, one thought. Can I jump in for a moment? Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's a guy named Noah Sasson. Uh, who is doing uh, research on autism, but instead of assuming that the autistic subjects are abnormal and the neurotypical researchers are normal, he's looking at um, what Damian Milton, a, a, an autistic scholar in Europe, calls the double empathy problem, which is for a long time, a huge misconception about autism was that autistic people lack empathy. And in fact, some autistic people have so much empathy that uh, they that it's disabling for them. Actually, they they feel the pain of others so intensely. Um, and so, 
what Noah and his colleagues are doing is, for instance, if there's a neurotypical person and an autistic person, and the autistic person's emotional state is hard to read for the neurotypical person, that's not a problem with autism. It's a two-way problem. It means that both people, both the you know the subject and the observer, you know the observer is always neurotypical. Um, that actually there's a problem on both sides of people being unable to read each other. And I think that is one of the most really uh, important and promising um, directions for research into various forms of neurodivergence, no longer assuming that the neurotypical way of doing things is the only right way to do things and that any deviation from that is pathological. Yeah, that's a great, great answer. Yeah, and um, to, to your point around, you know, extreme, like enormous empathy, um, I talk about that a lot in Divergent Mind because uh, synesthesia uh, occurs so much more commonly in, in autistic folks. And um, I focus on this trait of mere touch synesthesia, which is where like you can literally feel what other people are feeling. And there's a lot of research um, on that. There's uh, Joel Salinas is a neurologist. He was at Harvard and Massachusetts General. I interviewed him for the book. He also has a great book um, called Mirror Touch. Uh, and um, so yeah, definitely there should be more research on that. Um, I'm trying to think of more, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of gaps. Uh, well, I think black people, for instance, but there's, oh, has been course. so little research into black neurodivergence and there needs to be much more. Yes, for sure. Diversifying folks who are, who are researched. Um, I was going to say something else, but I just forgot. Sorry, it. sorry. That's okay. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> Um, the next guest is saying that um, so much of what you're saying resonates with me, especially with regard to depression and anxiety of symptoms of ADHD. Can you recommend some first steps for people, especially female identifying people, to take when they're not necessarily seeking a di diagnosis, but looking for tools and resources to make more comfortable at work? Oh, more comfortable at work. Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think like it's a process. It was definitely a process for me and for everyone who I talked to, you know, first there's kind of like this realization, there's this curiosity, like, oh, like, does this fit? Um, so usually there's a lot of reading in the beginning. Um, and then, I mean, a general, just kind of like slowing down, you know, even, you know, just, like a little bit of like self-compassion, self-forgiveness even. Then there's also this step of like, how do you talk to other people about it? It is good to process, you know, if you can with like a close friend or family member um, or, or a therapist, just like a general therapist. Um, and then I think like many neurodivergent folks, I spend a lot of time in nature that's really important to me. I live in a really quiet area. I go hiking basically every day. Um, and that really regulates my nervous system. You know, I feel really comfortable around the trees and walking along the creek. Um, that's a huge part of who I am. It's a huge part of my family's life. And that really, really suits me. Um, I have to say that noise and sound is, is, a, is a big one, actually. If you are in an office or even like a street corner where there's like loud sounds of cars or honking or something, it can really rattle you. And if you're getting exposed to that a lot, uh, it's going to be difficult to find kind of like a state of equilibri equilibrium. Um, so yeah, those are just some kind of general ideas. Thank you. Uh, we have um, a gentleman here who says that he works in the world of HR and he can see how neurodiversity is a difficult sell. How do you start the conversation with executives about the needs of employees with this ability? That's a great question. And I think, you know, Steve might echo this, but I actually think that one entry point into talking with executives is like oftentimes an executive will have a kid 
who might have some form of neurodivergence. And so then that just kind of, they light up, you know, they think about this conversation very differently. Um, so I would say if possible, you know, look for people who have some connection to this topic, like in a deep way, um, that's a great starting place. Um, it's also great just to highlight how much of this is now out in the media. You can say like, look, there's really a case for this. This is getting a lot of coverage. Um, and then lastly, I mean, companies are so into like workplace culture and things like that. And once a company does start the neurodiversity conversation, I mean, so many people start opening up. And um, to Steve's point earlier, Margot, who I interviewed, who was at Yahoo, and then her group got acquired by Verizon. She's still there doing amazing accessibility work. Um, uh, you know, she was so surprised that once this conversation started, so many people came forward about having ADHD, OCD, you know, and so suddenly it became this really open thing. And so, you know, the workplace culture changed. Mm -hmm. Steve, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I do. Um, one of the things that's really important is that is reframing the conversation around hiring neurodivergent employees away from the idea that it's some form of charity or being a good guy or, you know, being a, a you know, a, being generous. It's not about that. Uh, they've, there's, there's enough research now to show that companies that make a place for neurodivergent employees where they feel safe and uh, treasured really, or at least appreciated, that the companies do better. Like the Harvard Business Review, which is like big capitalism, you know, the Harvard Business Review did not put the word neurodiversity on, their, on one of their front pages a couple of years ago because it's nice. You know, if they put it there, because I think it was Walgreens when they hired uh, people with various forms of disability, both physical and, and uh, cognitive, uh, to work in a warehouse, that warehouse became the most productive warehouse in the Walgreens network. Like, this is actually about, you know, as, as the guy who's the head of the Autism at Work program at a German software company called SAP said to me, this is not about charity. This is about building value for our stockholders. You know, when you can, you know, I'm not into capitalism myself, but when you hear people or when people in involved in these big companies here, like, oh, it's about building stock value. You know, they get more interested than if they think it's, you know, about being a good human being, or something like that. So I think it's really important to get the message across that this is actually about building value for your company. And that it makes you, uh, you know, a, a better performing company to make these accommodations for neurodivergent employees. And, you know, Silicon Valley was basically built by people with autistic traits. I don't, I don't go as far as Temple Grand and say, oh, everybody in Silicon Valley has autism. They don't. But the autistic traits are very common. Um, and they've really created this future that we're living in now. Um, so anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that struck me about the book is that you talked about some of the strengths that neurodivergent people bring to the table. And maybe you could just share a couple examples of that with the listeners right now. Yeah, totally. Um, so um, in the book, you know, I focus again on autism, ADHD, synesthesia, sensory processing disorder, um, and then the, the trait of high sensitivity. Uh, HSP for short. Um, so um, in terms of strengths, um, there's so many. <laughs> I think that um, there's there's a reason that books like Dara's um, about, you know, Diary of a Young Naturalist um, are born from the deep empathy and connection that many neurodivergent people feel with the natural world. Um, living in more natural ways in symbiosis um, with sort of how we're meant to live. Um, that's, I think, a really, like, it's such a crucial uh, aspect of being human that we're in desperate need of right now as, as we face, you know, climate change and again, late stage capitalism. Um, so, and I really focus on, on that in a, in a sense, um, in the book, just 
the quality of being so deeply sensitive, being affected by things. Um, you know, many neurodivergent people are referred to as like canaries in the coal mine. Uh, people like, since we're affected by things so strongly, it can kind of be a signal to the rest of the world um, around what needs to be changed in our society. Um, to get more granular, I mean, so, you know, traits like creativity, empathy, uh, deep imagination. Um, and then you, of course, have people who have amazing minds in terms of categorization and, and being able to keep track of things. Um, amazing problem solvers and troubleshooters. I mean, I know that for me, that's a, a, a big one. Like I can respond to like an urgent situation pretty well. Like I, I just kind of light up when something needs to be like attacked, you know? Um, I think many neurodivergent people can relate to that. Um, so there's, there's so many, and, you know, I'm hesitant to give some kind of list or something. Cause I think the other thing that needs to be said is that neurodivergent people need to be seen and recognized in their full humanity too. You know, it's not just about, well, what do they have to offer to the world? You know, um, lately, like on social media, I've been posting about cooking, you know, just like my normal daily mundane stuff. And, um, you know, we're all in this pandemic right now at home. And that's a huge part of my life right now. And I think it's important when we think of like visual narratives around who we are as neurodivergent people that needs to be out there as well. So great, thank you. Our next guest is wondering if either of you have thoughts you'd like to share on intersections of autistic experience and LBGTQ experience, gender diversity, et cetera, and how we can best support queer and trans neurodivergent people. Uh, do you mind if I jump yeah. in? Um, yeah, I mean, something that I've thought about a lot is whether or not the fact that I'm gay also another color of neurodiversity. Um, and I, I haven't decided, you know, I, I rarely see um, uh, gayness, uh, you know, being talked about in the context of neurodiversity, except for the fact that a lot of autistic people seem to be somewhere on that spectrum. And also uh, a lot of autistic people, I, I have several autistic friends who have transitioned from one gender to another. That's really interesting. You know, there, there are any number of speculations that can be drawn. Uh, you know, is it that people do not uh, feel the same kind of peer pressure towards a standard gender identity, that's unthought. Uh, but we write to the point by actually- Oops, you're breaking up. Another question which says, your ideas well, I sure do. Your last couple of sentences yeah. froze and the microphone quit working. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's uh, down, down here on the question list. Can you hear me or no? No, we can, yes. Yeah. It says, uh, the questioner says, your ideas about reframing, rethinking psychiatric diagnoses are wonderful and radical. Do you see that happening anywhere outside of your book? Well, I sure do, because when I was a kid, I could have gone to a, been put in a mental asylum for, for being homosexual. Uh, I could have been arrested for committing a crime, for kissing my boyfriend. That's a and now I'm married. That's a tremendous amount of social change. They is this, how is any ever socially a reframing of the form orientation called it for people? What do you think? What do you, have you uh, neurodivergent connection? I'm, I'm having I'm having a little uh, trouble hearing you, Steve. I don't know if, if other people are. It's it's going in and out. Right. Um, so I don't know. Okay, I'll just shut up, actually. Just <laughs> oh. you talk. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. But did you have a question? I couldn't make out much. What was, what were you? Oh, what, what do you think of that intersectionality? 
between LGBTQIA oh, yeah. and neurodivergence, yeah. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's huge. I mean, we've seen this. I don't know how much research has been done on it. Um, I mean, I know some has for sure. Anecdotally, for sure. I think that um, I would say almost every single person I know who is autistic is queer in some way. I mean, whether mm. it's being non-binary, um, bisexual, um, gay, lesbian, trans. I think, I mean, um, I think I, in the beginning of your, of your response, you were saying you weren't sure if that had to do with just sort of like not feeling pressure to conform to a certain gender. I think that what I've observed in, in, in my interviews is that I think that for us as neurodivergent people, um, we get like physically uncomfortable if there is not a match between like sort of our outer and our inner, like it's real. I, there's, there's just something physiological there. Um, and so I do think there is this like this enormous internal push for things to, to match up, for it to feel real, um, to be reflected like from the outside for people to see us in like in a correct way. Um, and so I, I think naturally in the world, I think many more people are queer in some way. Again, since we have so much stigma and social norms that counter that, we don't see it full in public expression. Um, the other day I was tweeting about this because um, in, in Thailand where, where I lived for a little bit, um, it really truly felt like every other person was non-binary. And mm. I've, I've always been wanting to actually dig into the research around this. Um, I'm not sure what kind of cultural factors came together for it to just be like this. It's just like a non thing. Like, it's not like, you don't even hear this talked about much, but as you walk around, you just, there's just queerness everywhere. It, and it's not in, a, in any kind of siloed or like extreme. It's not like this neighborhood is this, it's just full, you know, just out there inter integrated. Um, so I use that as an example to show that uh, I believe that queerness is a, is a much bigger part of who we are as human beings to begin with. And so I think autistic and other neurodivergent people feel compelled to just live more in alignment with like their real natural selves. Okay, we're just about out of time, but I want to try and squeeze in this last question because I think there are probably a lot of parents in the audience who would enjoy hearing your answer. Uh, one of our guests is asking about advice on inspiring confidence around neurodivergence in a teen girl. She, they say they want to give strength to the quirky, but it's a word that they're frankly quite sick of. So how do you suggest that they inspire confidence in a teen? Yeah, I think so. I think the teen years are interesting and they're, they're also challenging because you're, you know, kind of getting ready for adulthood. I think this honestly depends on where you are too and what the kind of culture is like. Um, um, if there is, if you're in a school where, you know, being different is celebrated and like, it's, you know, kind of cool and people are encouraged to be who they are, then some of this might not be like a, a huge issue. If you're in, you know, kind of a different environment that's maybe a bit more like sterile or something, um, that's gonna be difficult. Uh, I think it's really important to find allies, you know, if there's like a really understanding teacher or counselor on site, um, or if there are other kids who might relate in some way, if there's a possibility to kind of, you know, create some kind of group or a, an event or something like that. Um, and yeah, I think honestly, I mean, teens are ready for a lot of this information. So I think giving teens kind of a glimpse of the possibilities and the future, you know, that, whoa, there's this really cool conversation and movement happening now around neurodiversity and isn't that awesome? Um, and then to, you know, hopefully seek that out in college as well. Um, yeah, so th those, those are some of the things I would say. 
Well, thank you. We are really out of time now. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I know that if our audience reads Divergent Mind and Neurotribes, they will certainly find many of those answered. Um, please know that I've pasted the links for both books into the chat box. And after the program, you can just copy and paste those into your browser. It'll take you right to Valley Bookseller and you can make your purchases. Janara Nirenberg and Steve Silberman, thank you both so much for generously sharing your time and insights with us all this evening. Divergent Mind and Neurotribes are both absolutely fascinating reading. I wish we were together in real life so that you could hear the sound of applause from the audience. <laughs> I'm sure they are as grateful to you as I am. On behalf of Valley Bookseller in Stillwater, Minnesota, I wanna thank you all for tuning in tonight and thank you for supporting an independent bookstore. Please check the Valley Bookseller website or www.lit-lovers.com to stay up to date on more of our programs. There will soon be a whole full spring schedule posted. Janara and Steve, again, thank you so very much. Good night, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. very much. Honor. Take care, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And thank you for putting up with our little tech issues tonight. <laughs> no problem. Thank You'll you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.